song Sweet Home Alabama? Apparently, it's written from the perspective of a frozen embryo. Because according to the Alabama Supreme Court, that's not just a frozen embryo. That's a dude. The Alabama Supreme Court has ruled that frozen embryos are children and that a person can be held liable for destroying them. An Alabama Supreme Court ruling has declared embryos are children, regardless of their location, and entitled to all legal protections just as a fetus in the womb. The Alabama Supreme Court ruled last Friday that frozen embryos are now considered children under state law. Yep, it said that considering a frozen embryo a child is a, quote, natural, ordinary, and commonly understood meaning of the word. And a lot of people aren't reporting on this, but they also said that there are no rules saying that embryos can't play basketball. He's right. Ain't no rules to the embryos. Can't play basketball. No! The case involves couples whose embryos were destroyed when a patient removed them from a freezer and accidentally dropped them. The court held that the patient could be held liable in a wrongful death lawsuit. Reproductive rights advocates say the case could have implications for fertility treatments such as IVF and the hundreds of thousands of patients who seek them. Because apparently these people think that this is an IVF clinic and this is what caused that lawsuit. Yeah, this is going to have some drastic consequences for people wanting to get IVF. V. Rodriguez, like so many others, is currently undergoing fertility treatment. We're this very traditional family that just wants to have a kid. But um, she's so now on edge everything. after the highest court in Alabama decided frozen embryos are children and people can be held legally responsible for destroying them. Rodriguez worries knowing doctors may find some of her embryos not viable. I don't necessarily want to implant a child that I know is going to miscarry. So what does that mean? My main worry is what are we going to do with the ones that are genetically abnormal? And what does this mean if my clinic shuts down? So now not only do they want to just force people to have children who don't want to have children, force people to be pregnant who don't want to be pregnant. Now they're saying that people who want to have children can't have children. Because this has never been about abortion. This has always been about controlling women. We have been wrestling with this decision for four days since we found out. We didn't take this lightly, but ultimately our legal team and our embryology team said that we cannot continue IVF care given the significant legal ramifications. And are there specific procedures you can continue with? So yes, fertility care is much more wide and diverse than just IVF. So we can certainly continue with inseminations and surgeries and ovulation induction, but our most successful treatment is being paused. That means Hmm. less babies will be born in Alabama. Hmm. And what are your patients saying to you today? Uh, um, It's heartbreaking. Um, The phone conversations that I've had to have with longtime patients who are desperate and ready to become parents And I'm having to tell them that I can't offer their treatment that we've agreed to. They are begging us to continue. They're saying, you know, we'll sign anything. Please let us continue with treatment. And then to make matters even more confusing for providers, the Alabama state legislator quickly passed a bill saying that patients and medical professionals were not to be held criminally liable for IVS treatments, meaning the law stands in direct conflict with the state Supreme Court ruling. And now, at the same time, federally, Republicans in the U.S. Senate blocked a similar bill seeking to protect IVF nationwide. There's so much confusion as a result of their assault on reproductive rights and reproductive freedom. It's the people who say they're all about family values that are now stopping people from being able to start a family. And why would they want to do this? Well, controlling women, but also God. Even before birth, all human beings bear the image of God and their lives cannot be destroyed without effacing his glory. If you guess the Bible, you guessed wrong. That statement was written last week by Alabama State Supreme Court Chief Justice Tom Parker. It was part of his recurring concurring opinion, ruling that the frozen embryos of IVF patients should be considered children saying unborn children are children without exception based on developmental stage, physical location, or any other ancillary characteristics. 
while the concurring opinion quoted scripture. What the because even though the overwhelming majority of Americans strongly support the availability of IVF for couples who are trying to have a baby, there are people who want to take away people's rights because of their rigid understanding of morality and lack of understanding of biology. The ability to start one's own family on their own timeline is a foundational freedom, and we need to protect that. And one thing we need to do, start to chip away at this black and white, rigid understanding of morality and of reality. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. Thank you for liking and subscribing and commenting and whatever else you do. I really appreciate it. I put the links down below for the social media as well as the Patreon and the merch. So uh, come on. You can join the party there. The other day I got home from hanging out with some friends, humble brag, and I got in the elevator in my building and I immediately noticed that it smelled like the worst body odor I have ever smelled in my entire life. Before the door closed, I saw a group of women walking towards the elevator. At this point, I had to make a choice. Do I hold the elevator door open for them to be polite, resulting in them thinking I was the smelliest person that they had ever smelled, or do I let it close and have them think I'm a rude person who doesn't hold the elevator? I had to choose quickly. So I hit that elevator closed door button as fast as I could. And I think it was the right choice. Either way, I lose. I don't come out on top in this situation at all. I don't look good in either scenario. And I know, I know some of you would say, hold the door open for them and let them know where that smell came from and let them make their own decision. They weren't going to believe me. They were going to think it was me. And even if I did tell them, they would have to be polite and sit through it. So I made a decision. And every day we are forced to make moral decisions. Everybody in the world seems to accept that there are things that are actually right and actually wrong. Even if we disagree on what those things are, I've never met anyone who didn't believe that something was actually good and something was actually evil. That there are certain things that are wrong no matter who you are, where you're living, what, what time period and history you're living. But if that's true, how would we know if there really are things that are right and wrong? Right, what is wrong, who's to say, really, in the end? I mean, because it is unknowable. Yes, there are laws in every country, there are rules in pretty much every religion, and most people have some sense of right and wrong. But yes, there are certain things that most people agree is wrong. Hey, that's not the wallet inspector. If you're not, if you're somebody who's not a, a religious person, you don't believe in God or the Bible, how would you know what is right and what is wrong? We couldn't turn to people. People change their minds all the time, and we know a lot of people have done a lot of evil in the world. We certainly can't trust an individual to tell us what is right and wrong, another human being. Of course we can turn to people. It's all we got. When people say, hey, this thing is hurting me, then we stop doing that thing and we apologize for doing it in the first place. That's the simple basic starting point of morality. We can't really turn to culture because most of the time, a lot of the time, the culture itself is the thing we're criticizing. We want it to improve. We think it's doing something wrong. Science itself cannot really tell us how things, how people ought to act, but it really tells us, well, how things do work. So where would you turn to find out what's right and wrong? It's hard for people to wrap their minds around the idea that, uh, that moral truth is not a matter of opinion, not a matter of either personal opinion or cultural opinion, group opinion, the, the opinions of a society or a culture. The idea that these things sit outside of opinion and exist on their own and they transcend every culture. Could that be true of moral truths? Well, let me just try to give you a quick way to respond to that. I think one thing sometimes people need is an example of something that transcends personal or, or group opinion. So let's just supersize it, okay? If we said, um, it's never okay to torture babies for the fun of it. That's a weird example. I'm glad no one else would use that. If we can agree that even one thing is actually wrong, like torturing babies for the fun of it, 
If we all agree that that is wrong. Okay, well, yeah, that's his son, so that makes sense. You can know that, say, torturing babies for fun is wrong and say there's no God. It's just that torturing babies for fun wouldn't be wrong unless there was a God. So And I give up. It would be wrong because it would hurt that baby. Because of the trauma, it would cause that baby and the person that baby grows up to be. They would probably have anxiety. They would probably grow up to have depression. They would probably grow up to have issues with controlling their anger and could take that out on other people. They could very likely have a substance abuse problem because of this, which would also affect other people and affect their health, all because of what happened to them when they were a baby. It would also cause emotional distress for the baby's parents or the people who care about that baby. There are so many reasons why it is not a good thing to torture a baby. That's a simple thing to figure out. And it has nothing to do with whether or not a god exists. I think that most people would recognize that as an objective, transcendent, moral truth claim. In the sense that if you saw somebody or met somebody who said, no, in my personal opinion, it's perfectly okay to torture babies for fun. You would say, dude, you need to get some help. It's not a matter of us trying to convince you that that's so patently obvious on its face. That but what could be that thing? What could be the standard? Where could this actually come from? Because we've got to explain. If we're going to say right and wrong exists, then we must explain where it came from. Could it come from something like culture, like just the way we were raised? Well, imagine if we were raised a different way. Would that make right and wrong different? Could it come from us personally? Well, it doesn't seem like it because we all know that we've done things that are wrong. I think if right and wrong really exists, then whatever makes things right and wrong must transcend all things. I got punched by a customer once when I worked at Starbucks. Do you think I needed a divine entity to exist somewhere in the universe or outside of the universe or whatever in order to understand that I was in physical pain and felt humiliated? No, I simply felt that way because when his fist hit me, it hurt. It's that feeling plus the empathy of others who understand why I felt that way that describes morality. It comes from those two things, one person feeling hurt and another person having empathy for that. The problem is, though, that most theists, especially most Christians, but especially most apologists, see morality as this floating thing that's out there, like a law of the universe, like there's gravity and there is morality. It's not about trying to figure out how to live our lives based on what causes the least amount of pain. It's about this thing, this actual tangible thing, this concept, this concept that is also like a noun, like a, meta, like a metaphysical, spiritual thing that, that exists in the universe that is morality. So to them, right and wrong isn't a thing that we created based on saying, hey, if my fist hits you, then you become hurt. And if I give you a gift, you become happy. But right and wrong exists because there is a special law of the universe that determines what is right and what is wrong. So instead of creating rules of ethics and morality, we discover these rules. Like how we aren't inventing scientific discoveries, but rather we're discovering them. Whether you learn these things as you're growing up or not, like you suggested, or you, as you read, or whether there's some kind of innate capacity that's built in, that God builds in, that you then experience later, these are all ways of knowing it. It doesn't make the thing itself. That's the ontological question. Where did it come from? That's the question. Where did the scoring system come from? Not how do you know it? What makes the scoring system? That's the key. It's called the grounding. Whereas someone else might say, hey, we know pain exists. We understand that empathy exists. And we have never demonstrated a God. So maybe we don't jump to that conclusion. Ooh, I'm installing an empathy chip. And that'll allow Bender to feel other people's emotions? Yes. If by allow, you mean force. Ooh. Ow. If I say that all soda comes from a soda-sweating dragon... 
I have to first show the existence of a soda sweating dragon. The problem that I see, though, is an atheist can't justify why something is good or bad without reference to a standard outside of humanity, and that standard is God's nature. So it's not an epistemological question. It's not how do you know right from wrong. It's why is something right or wrong? That's why I keep asking the atheists who are here, why do you say your position is right? By what standard? If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. But objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God exists. If the soda sweating dragon does not exist, then soda does not exist. Soda does exist. Therefore, the soda sweating dragon does exist. For the atheist, humans are just accidents of nature, highly evolved animals. But animals have no moral obligations to one another. When a cat kills a mouse, it hasn't done anything morally wrong. The cat's just being a cat. That's a terrible example. That mouse is that cat's food. We also eat meat, and a good majority of human beings think that is perfectly fine. We debate the ethics of eating animals, but that's exactly that. It's a debate. Because now, human beings have positioned themselves in a way that we don't actually need meat to survive, necessarily. But killing an animal to survive is a much different question than someone with a fully developed human brain deciding to kill another human being for the insurance money or for whatever other reason. We can easily understand why that is wrong without requiring a god. And if you don't know why that's wrong, it's very simple. It's because I don't want to be murdered for the insurance money, so I'm not going to murder another person for the insurance money. Even though, Sam, I do have an insurance policy out on you, I will not use it. If Sam goes missing, um... It's fine. And we can easily understand that without requiring a god. If god doesn't exist we should view human behavior in the same way. No action should be considered morally right or wrong. But the problem is, good and bad, right and wrong, do exist. Just as our sense experience convinces us that the physical world is objectively real, oh. our moral experience convinces us that moral values are objectively real. Every time you say, Hey, that's not fair! That's wrong! That's an injustice! You affirm your belief in the existence of objective morals. So a guy stole a phone after another guy fell. Sucks. Shouldn't have done that. But also, what if that guy stole that phone because he knew that there was a code on it that could stop a nuclear attack? Then it's probably good that he stole it. Hmm? We've searched the whole building, Golden Face. Where is the bomb? Hmm? We've searched the... Okay. They said... We've searched the whole building, Golden Face. Now, where is the bomb? But Christianity and the Bible tries to make everything black and white. The Bible had top ten lists of things you weren't supposed to do. It had laws and books of laws and lists of laws. And then Jesus was like, it's not just about the law. It's about doing unto others what you would have them do unto you. But also, here's a bunch of laws. And then Paul had a bunch of rules and a bunch of laws. They constantly try to boil down everything we can do to a list of rules. I am going to get a lot of hate for this video, but hands down, this is the scariest verse in all of the Bible. In Ephesians 5 verses 3 to 5, it makes a list of seven types of people who will not make into heaven. And then it goes on to say this about that group of people. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Why is this so scary? Because right now there are people in hell as we speak who listened to the deception of other people. Here's what you see, it's a list of rules, and the consequences for disobeying that list aren't to say that, hey, if you do these things, you will hurt people, and we don't want to hurt people. The consequence is, after you die, you will burn in hell. You will burn for eternity. But when you introduce an ethic like Christianity, which says that you must love your neighbor as yourself, and that you must care for the vulnerable and the poor, and that you must exercise justice and prudence in all of your affairs and all your dealings, and that if you don't, there will be eternal consequences for that. 
that's a pretty powerful dissuasion from the kinds of things that would typically disrupt community living. Yes, but also the fear of hell made people hang people they believe to be witches. It makes parents force their teenagers to get married because they got pregnant or force their gay or trans kids out of the house to become homeless and vulnerable for human trafficking because the parents don't want to be seen as approving of their lifestyle. So many evil acts have been done because people fear the consequence and they don't want to burn in hell. Not to mention that the concept of hell is immoral in itself and cannot come from the same being that is supposed to be the creator of morality itself. But Christians struggle with understanding morality as an absolute when we know that there are gray areas. It doesn't mean that we have every detail of morality figured out. How about when the Nazi comes to your door, right? What do you do then? Has to do Juden here? You've got Jews upstairs in your attic. Schnell, Schnell, come into here. Has to do Juden here? What are you, you going to do? You do. They're in there. Don't lie. Tell the truth to a murderer? What are you going to do? I know what I'd do. Lie. Why? Because when absolutes conflict, and Christians can disagree on this, but I'm just giving you my view. When absolutes conflict, the greater obligation takes precedence over the lesser obligation. You have a greater obligation to protect life than to tell the truth to a murderer. My grandfather lived in occupied Holland during World War II. And he built a living space under his barn to hide Jewish people. He also ran a very successful black market by selling things that he would steal from the German bases. He was a Christian man and continued to be very Christian until the day he died. But he never saw anything wrong with what he did there. Because there was nothing wrong with what he did there. In Canada, our food prices and rent are soaring right now due to greedy corporations. So, if I see someone walk into a store, take some food, and walk out with that food, no, I did not. That person's right to eat trumps the right of a billionaire to make a few more bucks. What if lying is ethical in this situation? What if a certain actions aren't universally good or bad, like Jonathan Dancy says? Jonathan Dancy? Are you talking about moral particularism? We never even covered that. You read on your own? You think just because I'm a straight hottie, I can't read philosophy for fun? For example, is it okay to steal? Well, if you're stealing the code that someone's trying to use to kill a million people, I suppose you could probably find a way to justify. See, called it. We in scripture know that if you are trying to repel an attack that someone's trying to kill you, you can do certain things you wouldn't be able to do otherwise and morally justify. If you're trying to save the lives of innocents, you are able to do certain things you would not be able to do otherwise. But if I simply add to the end of the claim, is it ever okay to steal for the fun of it? Hmm, now I've removed all the justifications. I'm not stealing so I can save innocent lives. I'm not stealing so that I won't be killed. I, I am stealing now for the fun of it? I've removed all the justifications. Now you've found the moral objective claim at the base of the claim itself. Okay, but for the fun of it is still a justification. It's a bad justification, and we are in the right to condemn that person, but it's still a justification. Because no action has the same reason every time we do it which is why we have to see things as nuanced and we have to understand things on a case-by-case -case basis. Killing someone because they are mean to you or because you get money from insurance if they die or because they witness you commit a different crime or because you think it's fun are all justifications, but they're not justifiable reasons to not get jail time. We also understand that just because something is the right thing to do doesn't mean it's a good thing. You have the right to kill someone to protect your family. That is the right thing to do. But it's not a good event. It's still going to be traumatic for you and for your family. It's the better option than allowing the person to kill you and your family. But there are still consequences. You're still going to be going to therapy for a very long time. Everything ever has nuance. And nothing is perfect. Because perfection 
does not exist. So there is no reason to believe that a perfect creator is behind anything. And the hierarchy exempts you from the lower obligation. You can think of a hierarchy like this. We have the greatest obligation to God, the next obligation to people, and the final obligation to things. The problem here is that a lot of things get lumped into that obligation to God part. If you are able to convince yourself that what you are doing is for God, then you have given yourself the ultimate permission slip. This is how good church-going folks justify bombing abortion clinics. This is how loving people justify disowning their children because of who they love. This is why your uncle can post the most disgusting, bigoted rant on Facebook and still think he is a holier person than you. You're racist against whites. You're racist against whites. She is. Let me give you a very simple four-step process. Now, this is fleshed out in my book called Right from wrong, where I walk you through illustration after illustration applying these four steps. First, you're faced with a decision. Consider the decision. Consider the choice. Okay, I have a choice. Um, Okay, okay, a choice. Yeah, I can do this. A choice, let's see. Do I or do I not throw hot coffee on a barista because it's too hot to drink and that upsets me? That's a tough decision. Number two, compare it to God. Okay, God killed people in the Bible with fire, and he sends all non-believers to hell after they die, and coffee is hot, but not as hot as hell. So I'm actually being kinder than God, which if you can be kinder than God, then that's got to be the most kind. So yeah, I say let's do it. Throw in that coffee. Number three, and this is where most people fail. Commit to God's way. Now, here's the problem. If you make a right choice there, you can have immediate negative consequences. If you make a wrong choice, you can have immediate positive consequences. Remember, we talked about that. Right choices lead to negative consequences immediately, not in the long run. And wrong choices leads to right consequences. So you must... Make that decision to commit to God's way. So I have a negative consequence for throwing a hot coffee on a 16-year-old barista by getting arrested for assault, but the good consequences will come later, and I must trust God. And then fourth, count on his blessings. Consider the choice, compare it to God, commit to God's way, and then count on his blessings. Think about that. You ought not steal from somebody. It's an obligation. You ought not do this. And obligations are always between persons. You are a thief of joy. Think about that. I could punch a table. There's no moral content there. But if I punch my neighbor, there's a moral issue there. Because moral obligations are not between inanimate objects. They're between persons. You are not morally obligated to physics. Physics cannot provide you with moral obligations. Moral obligations cannot be grounded in physics because moral obligations are grounded and exist between persons. Therefore, if there are objective transcendent moral obligations, who is the objective transcendent moral person to whom we're obliged? That's the problem. We cannot get these kinds of obligations in a universe that's governed by physics, but you could get these kinds of moral truths in a universe governed by a personal being who is the standard of moral truth. Whose table is it? Are you damaging that table? Are you punching the table because you are trying to intimidate your wife because you want to keep her afraid? What if you found out your neighbor has been hurting his kids and that's why you're doing it, or he's been hurting your kids? Is it okay to punch him then? These are things we have to consider because absolutes don't exist. Maybe it's easier to say that we are just figuring it all out. And there is no moral authority. There is no physical thing that is morality. Western civilization has been able to exceed the limitations that no other civilization has ever been able to do throughout all of human history. And I think that the reason for that is that in the place where most civilizations get to and stall out, Christianity was able to provide a harmonious, holistic set of ethics that helps people rally together and to build harmonious communities that would prosper beyond anything else we've ever 
quite sure how anyone can say something like that without seeing how it's dripping in white supremacy. The argument might as well be, I can't acknowledge that Western civilization colonized and pillaged and destroyed other cultures, stealing everything these cultures created along the way. I can't acknowledge that civilizations who do things differently than Western civilization can still be strong, flourishing civilizations. Or that he simply thinks that Western civilization is the only developed part of the world. But let's break this all down. Christianity says that we know right and wrong because right and wrong exist as a force that can't be broken, like physics. That because it exists, it means that God exists. And since God exists and he is the creator of this morality, his opinion is the first thing we should consider when making a decision. It creates a whole lot of black and white thinkers who you can't have a conversation with about any topic because changing minds based on new information is not a thing they can do. They can't wrestle with moral dilemmas because there's no such thing as a moral dilemma. Everything has an answer. That is ethically questionable. <sighs> so let's take a moment and see how that plays out in a couple different moral dilemmas. For the first one, let's go with the question, should parents spank their kids? A lot of people would start off by saying, I was spanked and I'm fine. Okay, so first, no, you aren't. Second, that's not how you determine if something is beneficial. Sure, maybe you turned out fine and all the things that aren't fine are for other reasons, but that doesn't mean on average people who are spanked as kids turn out as good or better than those who weren't spanked. When looking at this idea as a parent, you may say, hey, let's look at the facts. Let's look at what psychiatrists are saying. Let's look at what the latest studies are saying about what is the best way to discipline your children and if spanking is a beneficial or a harmful thing for kids. Looking out the window, that's a peddling. Staring at my sandals, that's a peddling. New study shows children who are spanked are more likely to defy parents, have more aggression, antisocial behavior, and mental health problems. Academy of Pediatrics advising parents strongly against spanking their children. In a new policy statement published just yesterday in the journal Pediatrics, the group advises parents to use what they call healthy forms of discipline. It seems like every year we've talked about this, there seems to be yet another study when it comes to spanking your kids. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it harmful? The most recent one out of the University of Missouri, and it says it can have negative impacts as far as 10 years later. But in Christianity, Morality is seen as fixed, and the Bible is understood as fixed. So when you look at an issue like, should I spank my child? You usually already know what to do because your church has been drilling it into your head your whole life, and you were probably told what the answer was in your Christian marriage counseling, and the Bible says, spare the rod, spoil the child, so you don't have to think about it at all. You just do it. Assuming that we have a fair home and are raising the kids gently, Paul says we must discipline. And the Greek word is what we refer to as corporal punishment or spanking by a few swats on the fleshy bottom of a child. That I think giving them chances before you start getting physical is the way to go. So we'll like, you know, tell them, all right, you gotta stop, you gotta stop, you gotta stop. And if they don't stop, then I say, okay, if you don't stop right now, I'm gonna spank you. But... Big butt. <laughs> Big butt. <laughs> like from the rap song. <laughs> nice. You have to follow through. Don't say, I'm going to spank you. And then they do it again. You're like, if you do it again, I'm going to spank you. And they do it again. If you do it again, like, no. If you say, I'm going to spank you, if you do it one more time, you do it. Yeah. Because you want them to believe you. You don't want to be warning them over and over. And we've been spanking them with a spoon. We don't do it very often. I would say on average, like once a week or something, you think, or more. God uses suffering to discipline his children. So do we. Now, you don't damage a child. You don't like that and big a big black eye or break his arm. Or the, Children have little fat bottoms so that they can be whopped. Who is letting this man talk on the internet? Who's setting up cameras for this man? S stop it. That we've taken from God's word and God has instructed us, because you're going outside of the circle of protection, that we can use the rod to drive you back in so that you understand this is what happens to sinners who don't repent. This is a small, teeny tiny taste of eternity without forgiveness. So if you continue to be a rebellious child, you can look forward to an eternal spanking. I don't like this. I don't like this one bit. 
Proverbs chapter 23, verse 13 says, Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish him with the rod, he will not die. In the context of verses 13 and 14, die means experience spiritual death in hell. Children who respect authority and feel sorrow for their sin are much more likely to ask Jesus to forgive them and be saved. Yeah, beat the fear of hell into them. That'll make them a wonderful, well-adjusted adult. But the point is that these people don't wrestle with these ideas. They have their answers. They believe everything is set in stone. Lisa, run outside and cut me a switch. Yes, sir! So now let's take a look at gay marriage and same-sex relationships. A person who wants to make an ethical, morally sound decision on whether or not to support someone who has fallen in love with another adult and wants to spend the rest of their life with that person may ask themselves, who does this hurt? And then quickly realize that it's nobody and say congratulations and where are you registered for gifts? Oh, look, I can accept the fact that he's gay, but... Why does he have to slip a ring on this guy's finger so the whole world will know? Why did you marry George? We loved each other. We wanted to make a lifetime commitment. Wanted everybody to know. That's what Doug and Clayton want, too. Everyone wants someone to grow old with, and shouldn't everyone have that chance? But someone who has a fixed understanding of morality based on what their church believes and what they think the Bible says may go on a stupid rant about rainbows and colors. Celebrate the rainbow, which of course signifies God's promise to us and the Noahic covenant that we read about in Genesis 9. That's that's what everyone is celebrating, right? That's what that's what all the rainbows are about. Uh, just a reminder, that's the covenant he made after murdering a bunch of us because we partied too much. It is a covenant that says that he won't murder us the same way again. Oh, right. It's something a little bit different because the real rainbow has seven colors and the pride rainbow has six colors. Of course, now they add all the other silly colors on there, but there's always been that distinction, which I think is actually pretty significant considering that seven means completion and perfection in the Bible. And that is the sign of faithfulness that God gives us in Genesis 9. So... No, no, not not that. The real rainbow has all the colors. It's a spectrum of light. They chose seven colors back in the day as red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet because they saw seven as the number of completion. And we use six colors now because we see that as the three primary colors and the three secondary colors. It's not a conspiracy. It's just colors. There are no silly colors. They are just how our eyes understand a part of the light spectrum. My brothers and sisters, I'm going to say this as lovingly and as gently, but as firmly as I can. There is no scenario that exists that any Christian should ever attend a gay wedding under any circumstances, no matter what. It doesn't matter whether it's your grandson. It doesn't matter whether it is your own child whom you love. There is no scenario that exists. It does not matter. Biblically speaking, a Christian should never attend a wedding from a gay couple. And I'm going to give you five reasons why That wasn't gentle or loving, but thanks for being a terrible person as always. First of all, I would say, what do you mean by equal rights? Because uh, first of all, the word equal implies that the behavior is the same and the behavior isn't the same. In fact, that's the very reason people were fighting for same-sex marriage, because they didn't want to be involved in an opposite sex marriage. It's a different behavior. Look, everybody already had equal rights before the Supreme Court imposed same-sex marriage on the entire nation. Everyone had the equal right to marry somebody of the opposite sex. Someone who actually wrestled with this issue might realize that he is making the same exact argument that was made against interracial marriage. They have equal rights. They are free to marry anyone in their own race. When it comes to the question of the LGTV the LGTV? Like, are you get, are you shopping for a new television? Is that what's happening here? I believe that God designed 
marriage and the act of intimacy to be enjoyed exclusively between one man and one woman. That is it. Everything outside of that is out. Oh, oh, he's talking about what couples he likes to watch on TV. That's fine. You can have your own preferences there. But you see, because God says it and they believe it, there's no conversation to be had. But you cannot make a proper ethical choice and form actually grounded ethical beliefs without being able to discuss and walk through these issues. All you are doing is repeating what you were told is good or repeating what you were told is bad and not putting any thought into it, which, yes, can be an easier way to go through life, but it's also a very, very harmful way to go through life. What? If gays get married, the institution of marriage will be destroyed. Societies will crumble. Rivers will run with blood. Nazis will once again ride on dinosaurs. But let's go back to what I opened this video with. An embryo is a dude. How do, folks? Name's Ted Brogan. (laughs) Ted Brogan? We were going to name you Michael. Yeah? Well, it's Ted Brogan. And to a lesser extent, whether or not they should be allowed to play basketball. Give me the ball! (laughs) Oh, jeez. Life begins at conception, not at birth. The moment you are conceived, you're a living soul made in the image of Almighty God. Uh, David said in Psalm 139, you made all of my delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Well, because every single one of those 60 million were innocent and defenseless human beings. And it is always wrong always wrong to directly and intentionally kill innocent and defenseless human beings. It's as simple as that, you know. Our position is very straightforward. That's our whole position. I just summed it up. It's as simple as that. And yeah, it's comforting to have simple answers and to think things are simply answered, but they never are. I can make a moral stance because I see this moral dilemma for what it is, simple, Black and white, no gray areas, where's my sign? When you set up this argument, the simple no gray areas approach, you shut down any discussion and you shut down critical thinking. It doesn't matter that this embryo they're talking about only has six to 10 cells compared to the 26 billion cells of a newborn baby or the 36 trillion cells of a full grown adult. It doesn't take into account that the uterine wall regularly rejects embryos. Uh, well, I just don't like your uterus. Don't get me wrong, your eggs are in great shape, but you have a T-shaped uterus, and that combined with your advanced maternal age, uh, it's preventing proper implantation. It decided that it starts at conception, and from now on, it's not a discussion. It's we are right and you support murder for disagreeing with us. Now, sadly, this date is on March 10th because there was a uh, abortionist, David Gunn, who was killed on this day, uh, murdered outside of his clinic in 1993. Not something we would condone, but that's the sad fact of what happens inside of an abortion clinic every day, that it's the murder of innocent babies happening. And that's why we should be speaking up against these things. And for way too many, they can't even consider the possibility that there could be any exceptions to their rule. I supported the exception. I just thought it was logical, right? I mean, how could you force a woman who became pregnant through no choice of her own to bear a baby? And I didn't realize at that time that, like, that's a child of God. It's not a baby. And that was crass. By saying this, he's saying that a 12-year-old who gets impregnated by her stepfather has to carry that baby to term with all that implies. Because this man believes that that is a child of God. And even though when the abortion would happen, there isn't even a brain formed yet, he has made his decision on the humanity of this fetus. So it supersedes the humanity of this child that has to be pregnant now. Or even when that pregnant person's health is at risk. What I would say to that, Megan, is that it's wrong to directly kill innocent people 
just to provide for the needs of others, even grave needs, such as if someone's life is in danger. However, however, there are many cases where we can act in medicine if a pregnant woman's life is in danger to attack whatever pathology or disease or whatever is harming her. Because uh, obviously, if a pregnant woman's life is in danger, ideally, the pregnancy should continue and the child will be born. We would try to cure whatever is wrong with her body and save the child's life, right? That'd be the right. ideal. You're right. And so, I mean, pregnancy is a normal thing for a woman's body to go through. So whatever is wrong, whether it's high blood pressure or the child is caught up in a scar tissue of the fallopian tube and is growing in the fallopian tubes... Uh, we should try to treat those those problems. And what happens sometimes is when we treat, when a doctor treats the medical problem a pregnant woman has that's grave, let's say, you know, the fallopian tube is scarred or is the, the child has become entrapped there and is growing, we might remove, rightfully so, the damaged section of the fallopian tube that could be hurting the mother. And unfortunately, we foresee the child will die, but it's an unintended consequence. So we, are, we aren't allowed to directly kill someone just to save somebody's life, but we can uh, make a medical intervention that unintentionally ends a child's life. Oh, good. You get to find a loophole. Yay. Good for you. It doesn't matter that the Bible isn't actually against abortion and specifically says that life begins at first breath and that there's a passage giving priests instructions on how to do an abortion. It doesn't matter that other cultures at the time the Bible was written did ban abortion, but the Bible doesn't. People against reproductive rights, anti-abortionists, were able to convince people that the Bible was against abortion and convince people that life begins at conception. And it also helped that it was framed as something that promiscuous women did to hide their disgusting, sinful lifestyle. But now it's affecting IVF. It's not just forcing people to be pregnant. It's forcing people who want to be pregnant to not be pregnant. It's affecting the wrong demographic. So now these previously outspoken people don't know what to do. Because for the first time, some of these people actually have to wrestle with nuance. Morality and ethics are complex. A lot of the time, whether something is right or wrong involves a lot of thought and a lot of discussion. Sometimes it's as simple as don't kick me in the shins, and sometimes there's a lot more to it than that. But one thing I have learned over and over again in the last couple of years of doing this is that some people just want to believe what they want to believe. But I am so glad that more and more people are realizing that this is no way to go through life. I'll drop an ethics bomb on you. Would you steal bread to feed your family? Boom! Exactly, Andy. Yeah, I took intro to philosophy twice, no big deal. It's a trick question. The bread is poisoned. Also, it's not your real family. You've been cuckolded by a stronger, smarter male. No, that's not how it works. Question your assumptions. Question your biases. Question your long-held opinions. Look for opportunities to love people. It's okay to use your brain once in a while. Hey, everybody, thank you so much for making it this far. If you know somebody who may benefit from it, send it their way. And uh, thanks again. You are all awesome and beautiful and wonderful human beings who are awesome. And I love you. Work, 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 Sky Moon. <laughs>